watch this vidcast or I'll gouge your eyes out. Welcome back, horror hounds, to Ghostman and Rivera's Horror Show Podcast. I'm Mike Ghostman Pickle. And I'm James Rivera. We have an interview with a friend of ours, Nick Thur, today. He is an actor and a producer on an upcoming horror indie horror film called Slapface. Before we get to that, we have to get to horror show news. The Real House from the Conjuring is being streamed live for a week. Kevin James to play a villain in Becky, a brutal rated R home invasion film. Nev Campbell is in talks to star in Scream 5. Bruce McDonald, director of Pontypool, returns with the comedy crime horror Dreamland. And our final news story, Macaulay Culkin has crazy sex scenes with Kathy Bates in the upcoming American Horror Story season. Of course he does. <laughs> but the first uh, news story is about The Conjuring House. From May 9th through May 16th, they're going to live stream the original Conjuring House. It's, uh, it's gonna, they're going to charge $4.99 per day or $19.99 for the entire week. And a portion of the proceeds will go to COVID-19 relief funds. The house actually belonged to the Perone family, in case you haven't seen uh, The Conjuring. It's in, uh, it was in Rhode Island in 1971, and it was investigated by the Warrens. Corey and Jennifer Heinzen, who are paranormal investigators, bought the house. And the Dark Zone site that's hosting the event says this, The world is on lockdown, and so is the family living in the house that inspired The Conjuring. Watch as the Heinzen family shows you how they live amongst the spirits while toughing out this worldwide pandemic. You will get an immersive and interactive look inside the real Conjuring House. When paranormal activity happens, you'll see it live. From seance to conjurings, there's a full week schedule of planned activities, investigations, and tests to perform, plus a full roster of paranormal celebrities who will be joining the live stream, virtually visiting with the family. They'll hear from Andrea Perone, the author, lecturer, and the original survivor of The Conjuring Haunting, Dave Schrader of Darkness Radio and The Holster Files, Susan Slaughter from Paranormal Caught on Camera, I've seen her a lot, uh, Brian Kano from Paranormal Caught on Camera as well, Colin Browen from The Paranormal Files, Patrick Doyle from Ghost Mine, Jay Verberg from Ghost Mine, Barry Fitzgerald from Ghost Hunters International, Joe Chin from Ghost Hunters International, Jimmy Church from Fade to Black, Bridget Marquardt, from Ghost Magnet and the Outlander Heidi Hollis from Angels to Aliens, Aiden Sinclair from Illusions of the Past, Jay and Marie Yates of Haunted Case Files, Rick McCollum of the Haunted Ghost Hunters, and Sophia Temporelli, the ghost host, and one more, Sam Boltruasis, the author of Ghost Riders, and many more. Sounds like a who's who of the paranormal investigation community. Yeah, where's Zach Bagans though? Why is Zach Bagans in the mix there? In recent years, because of The Conjuring's films, there's been a very large renewed interest in the cases of Ed and Lorraine Warren. And there's been a lot, uh, they've gained a, a bigger following since those films. So I imagine a lot of the diehard fans, and of course the fans who were uh, fans before The Conjuring are definitely going to want to stream this and check it out. It sounds, I, sounds almost like the Phantasm Con that we talked about a, a, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Right, taking advantage of the situation that's happening in a good way, of course, and giving a lot of fans a lot of what they want while trying to contribute to helping us out of the mess that we're in right now. So it sounds pretty cool. This actually sounds like something I would do. Like I've wanted to do something like this with the Amityville Horror House since the 70s. Mm -hmm. so the, the, uh, the Amityville Horror book was the first book that I read when I was five, six years old. So I've always wanted to buy that house and then uh, uh, somebody replaced the crescent windows with regular shaped windows. So I want, I've, for years I wanted to move in that house, replace the crescent windows and then do something like this, live stream the house, have yearly tours. Do you think anything will actually happen in this um, live stream? I don't know. I get the feeling that nothing might happen during this live stream because too many people are watching it and it's going to be too occupied with too many celebrities. 
So Kevin James to play a villain in Becky. This is really interesting. The film centers on a rebellious 14-year-old Becky as she's brought to a weekend getaway at a lake house by her father in an effort to try to reconnect after her mother's death. The trip takes a turn for the worse when a group of convicts on the run, led by the merciless Dominic, who is played by Kevin James, suddenly invade the lake house. Becky, not daddy's little girl anymore, decides to take matters into her own hands. Uh, it's going to be released digital and on demand on June 5th, so that's coming up pretty fast. It stars Joel McHale and Lulu Wilson uh, of Ouija Origin of Evil, Evil and Annabelle Creation. It's rated R for strong, bloody, violent, grisly images and language. Uh, Wilson plays a home alone type ass kicker. James plays a bearded, bald Nazi. I think this is going to work only because when you take people like Kevin James who are associated with one type of thing, which is mostly harmless comedies or like just like uh, cheap goofball comedies, you could use that image against the audience to make the to make the film more effective. Kevin James is probably going to be really good in this because I doubt that they would have taken a comedy actor like that if they didn't have a good plan on how to use him. Yeah, and I actually like to see comedians and horror films so you got Kevin McHale from Community which he's he's always a wisecracking type of type of guy even when he's not being funny he's kind of a kind of a Weisenheimer you know it's cool to see him as the protagonist and then someone like Kevin James another comedian as the villain and then you throw into the mix this little girl from Ouija 2 Origin of Evil she's gonna kick everybody's ass it sounds interesting to so me. he was that frightening little kid from Ouija the one who started talking about how death feels like lighting a match inside your lungs, right? Yeah. Okay, that little girl was creepy. It's gonna be a big change up for Kevin James. I think this is probably what he needs. And I imagine as an actor, it's probably liberating that for once he gets to be in something a little bit more serious. And yeah. let's be honest, what actor doesn't enjoy playing a good villain? I think exactly. every actor wants to play a bad guy in a film. Yeah. And I originally became interested in seeing this. Uh, there's a fellow interviewer that's on my friends list on Facebook, and he posted how he watched it and he's going to review it, but he's not allowed to review it yet. But all he said it was it's the best performance of Kevin James' career. Our next news story I'm pretty excited about. Nev Campbell is in talks to star in Scream 5. Uh, the directors are Matt Bettinelli Olpin and Tyler Gillett, and Kevin Williamson is rumored to be writing the script. Nev says that she's in negotiations to return. And this is what she said in an interview with uh, Rotten Tomatoes. We're having conversations. I've been approached about it. The timing's a bit challenging because of COVID. You know, we only started the conversation maybe a month and a half ago. So it's gonna take some time to figure out how it's all going to work out. We're negotiating, so we'll see. In an interview with Jake Hamilton with People, uh, Neff Campbell said that she was initially initially really apprehens apprehensive about doing another screen without Wes because he was such a genius and he is the reason they are what they are. Uh, she says in a new interview that Open and Gillett wrote her a very touching letter about Wes Craven and how he is such an inspiration to them and how they really want to honor him. If Kevin Williams is, is involved like they say he is, I'm gonna be fully on board. What made Scream good was a combination of Kevin Williamson's extremely clever writing, uh, his dialogue, and Wes Craven's excellent direction of all of it. Now, it is gonna be kind of sad to see a Scream movie without Wes Craven because it's it's one of the few French horror franchises where the original filmmaker st stuck with it the whole way through. Most of the time, they make one and once a sequel's made, it's a different director and occasionally the director might return for them. But this is the one series that has been consistent through, throughout all of them. So there is a part of it that, a part of me that is a little bit apprehensive because Wes Craven's not around to direct this. I'm excited because these directors just did Ready or Not. Mm -hmm. And they're not gonna do a, they're not gonna follow up a movie like Ready or Not with a bad movie. And, and especially if it's a passion project like this, that they, that they really want to do it justice and they're really big Wes Craven fans and they, don't, they just don't want to do just a cash grab. You know? I think Ready or Not uh, shows that these might be the right filmmakers for the job because I wouldn't say Ready or Not is like Scream, but like Scream, it mixes extreme violence with a lot of very with a lot of very clever humor and some genuine laugh out loud moments. And Scream as much as it was about the horror, about the suspense elements in it, 
it was equally about satire and it was equally about making you laugh. What made them so good is their ability to keep you on the edge of your seat one moment and have you holding your breath in the next moment to have you rolling in laughter. So these directors seem to have got gotten that formula down with Ready or Not. I'm convinced because if they were able to convince Nev, and she was always the one that was steadfast about, no, I'm not doing another screen film unless Wes Craven is directing. So she was always adamant about that. So if they convinced her, I'm convinced. I wonder who's going to return. Are we going to be seeing the return of David, uh, David Arquette, of Courtney Cox? I think if Nev's in, then they're in too. You know who one person who I would like to see, especially with these director's connections to her? Samara Weaving. Something tells me right. she, her acting style would fit in perfectly in the world of Scream. She would play off uh, Nev Campbell really well, I think. Bruce McDonald, the director of Pawnee Pool, returns with the comedy crime horror film Dreamland. The movie stars Stephen McCaddy of Pontypool, Henry Rollins of Black Flag uh, fame, and Juliette Lewis. Nice to yeah. see Juliet. Yeah, nice to see Juliet Lewis come out in more stuff lately. The synopsis is: On the orders of his boss, low-level gangster Hercules, played by Rollins, hitman Johnny, played by McCaddy must cut off the pinky finger of a celebrated jazz trumpeteer, the maestro, just before an important high-profile gig. Seems simple enough, but the gag, but the gig is a wedding at the fortified palace of crime queen, the Countess, and Johnny isn't quite feeling it. Hercules is moving up from standard gangster stuff to human trafficking, and the reason for the pinky request is more of a slight than anything else. Like all movie hitmen, Johnny is thinking of getting out of the game, and this job has convinced him it's time to retire. Throw in the Countess's vampire brother. A vampire brother. Wow, that's <laughs> really shaking this uh, premise. His child bride and the wedding from hell. You, you'll think you've imagined it all, but no, it's just a visit to Dreamland. So apparently the film had its North American premiere at Fantasia Fest and releases on video on demand on June 5th, the same day that Becky gets its release. Yeah. I don't know what I'm looking forward to more. I really like the premise of this and only because it sounds completely batshit and wacky. It sounds like yeah. when you start to read it, it sounds like a simple premise with a simple thriller element, you know, cutting off a jazz trumpeteer's uh, pinky, but then you throw a vampire in there at a wedding from at a wedding that has from hell, as they say, and the movie's called Dreamland. Who knows what kind of batshit insanity we're in store for with this one? Yeah, and I'm excited for anything that the director of Pawnee Pool does. I want to see him do another Pawnee Pool. Because I love it. It's one of my absolute favorite horror films in the past few years. Wildly original, very well written and well directed. And I love seeing Stephen McHattie and in, in everything. We just seen him in Come to Daddy and he was criminally underused in that one. So I really, I really like to see him in another starring role in another movie from the Pontypool director. And Juliette Lewis is my favorite actress. She hasn't done enough horror. It's great to see her in this. I mean, it's not straight up horror. But it seems to just go batshit crazy enough with vampires and shit that it's gonna become horror. That I, I love when horror springs out of a crime situation like that. It's nice to always see Henry Rollins. He's always a welcome presence on anything. So our final news story is the weirdest one. Macaulay Culkin is gonna have crazy sex scenes with Kathy Bates in an upcoming American Horror Story season. Uh, Macaulay Culkin actually decided to join the cast because of this. This, was, this comes from Ryan Murphy. Ryan Murphy told Culkin that he had a very great, insane part for him. And then Murf, Murf, uh, Ryan Murphy recently told E! News, I told him he has crazy, erotic sex with Kathy Bates and does other things. He paused and he goes, this sounds like the role I was born to play, okay? Mm -hmm. So he signed up right then and there. Besides Culkin and Bates, season 10 will star Sarah Paulson, Evan Peters, Leslie Grossman, Billy Lord, Adina Porter, Lily Robbie, uh, Angelica Ross and Finn Whitrock. And when the season will be filmed is still uncertain. Of course, everything's gonna be a little uncertain for a while right now. Yeah, and, and according to Ryan Murphy, he said it's fully written, the season is fully written, but it's seasonal. A lot of it centers around what weather is outside. So this kind of throws off their whole thing because they don't know when they're actually gonna get in production. And when they get into production, it might be the wrong season. So they might end up skipping this season and bringing it on next season. I mean, uh, American Horror Story is one of the few cable shows that actually has run consistently on time year after year. 
it lately, I mean, you've noticed it's become more of a common practice for television shows to take two years off at a time. Fuck, some TV shows take three years off. Ryan Murphy's own American Crime Story has large gaps in between the seasons. There's only been two seasons over the course of five or six years now, about five years yeah. now, and he's still planning another one, and the other one isn't going to be coming anytime soon. So I think that it's forgivable if American Horror Story skips one year. However, I know a lot of fans are going to be disappointed because American Horror Story has become an annual tradition for horror fans, and people look forward to it every year. And yeah. I know it's going to upset some people that it's not running on schedule, but hey, it is what it is. And I'm okay with it, uh, with holding it off, especially if they're going to produce something good. I don't want them to film it in the wrong season. If it's supposed to be in the summer, I don't want them filming it in the winter. I'd Makes rather sense. just hold off and wait until they get it completely right. We don't need to see any cheap day for night scenes being done. We don't need to see anything like that. And I like the addition of Macaulay Culkin. We did talk about him joining the the show uh, on the podcast a couple months ago yeah he seems to be the right fit for this style of story the the career that his the trajectory that his career has gone on ever since he's become a child star seems right for something like this when you think about his roles and stuff like party monster and you think about going all the way back thinking about something like the good son it's been a while yeah. since we've seen macaulay culkin and something flat out horror and I think his brothers have been kind of outshining him recently. You see them appear more yeah. frequently in films and TV shows than you see Macaulay. So it's nice to be having him back. Although I don't think anybody was asking for a sex scene between Kathy Bates and Macaulay <laughs> Culkin. But hey, we got it and I hope it's entertaining. <laughs> yeah, that, that's going to be interesting to say the least. And it's nice to see some of the cast uh, returning after they took a lot of time off. From uh, A lot of them weren't, didn't go for American Horror Story 1984 last year. And I guess that yeah. makes sense because the type of story that that one was going for was more suited for different types of actors than the ones that they normally use anyway. And everyone involved seems to be really excited about this script. So I'm with you. If, if they need to hold off a full season and do it next season, I'm down for that. Because, you know, there's going to be a gap in production of all movies and TV shows, right? But I think the horror genre is thriving so much right now. There's so much being released. that I think there's going to be a just, there's going to be a little uh, a slowing, I think, of the releases. But I think there's going to be plenty to fill in those gaps when we have to wait for stuff like American Horror Story. Next, we have an interview with Nick Thur. I'm very excited for you guys to get to know a little bit more about Nick. Really cool guy, uh, very good actor, and an upcoming producer on the indie horror scene. This kid's got a lot going on. We'll find out a lot about him in this interview. Hope you enjoy. Horror show exclusive. We have Nick Thur on the podcast today. How are you doing, Nick? I'm doing well. I'm on my second glass of wine, so not bad. <laughs> in for me too my second glass for the night and you know what Costco <laughs> cheap wine it's still good so <laughs> oh, no, my family is wine connoisseurs so there's a bunch of it all over the house so <laughs> I have it whenever I want it's like hiding your wine you just go find it in different rooms yeah I so, didn't know this was a wine party I only brought water I um, didn't know it was a wine party either this is all coincidental every party's <laughs> a wine party if you make it there you go <laughs> So uh, before we get started, how are you handling the lockdown situation right now? Uh, the lockdown situation has been surprisingly refreshing. I, I have friends that are nurses that are doctors and stuff, and I feel for them because they're going to hell. So I applaud them. I appreciate all the first responders. But uh, on my end, being in the entertainment industry, I'm one of the few lucky people that's been benefiting from it. Um, my movie that you know I worked on is in post, so I've had time to actually go through edits, go through music, do all that fun stuff. Um, and then on top of that, I'm reading new scripts. I'm working on my apartment. I'm one of those people that bought a full gym for my backyard, so uh, I really haven't had to leave. I just feel for those people that don't have the luxury of still working or have to go out day in, day out. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> So you were born in New York City, correct? I was born in actually upstate New York. I was born in Buffalo. Um, don't typically like to talk about that because it's. Uh, I was only there for like five years before I migrated down to Atlanta. Um, 
So a town, dirty South, uh, New York. I have a slight relationship with, cause I, I film there. I travel there to visit family and stuff. Everyone like I haven't in a while. I used to travel and visit family. So uh, I'm much more of a Southern boy mixed with a New Yorker mixed with a Californian now. So right. a little everything. So <laughs> is it, is it acting that brought you to California? Uh, yeah, primarily acting is what brought me out here to California. I, I honestly was over Georgia, uh, politics, the, the people I love, uh, the people are the sweetest, but I, I needed to change the scenery. I'm a beach boy. Uh, I'm a skateboarder at heart. Been doing that since I was 13. Uh, so on top of acting, I just love the vibe out here in California. So it was, it was like a full package. How old were you when you moved to California and when did you realize you wanted to be in the movie industry or be an actor? Uh, I started modeling when I was 17. Don't tell some of those photographers. Um, and I, from there, I just kind of, you know, stumbled into acting. I, I realized, you know, I, I love creating stories. I love being the person that gets to tell those hard stories, those ones that people don't want to talk about. Those are the things I love to make. And that's what drew me into acting is getting to really captivate people with stuff they don't really want to talk about normally. Um, so starting modeling at 17, by 18, I was you know in the acting world, and by uh, I think eight somewhere between 18 and 19, I moved to Seattle, and then from there I moved to California and just hit the ground running. It's it's been my age myself now. I've been out here on and off for about you know seven eight years. Wow. So what what draws you to the horror genre in particular? Uh, the horror genre for me has just always been fun. I, if you ever see my reel, which I mean, you guys have, uh, I don't have everything in there, but I'm usually either a villain or uh, I usually die. <laughs> I've had my head chopped off. I've had, you know, I've been strangled. I've everything under the book. I've been shot. Um, something about horror just captivates audiences, no matter uh, what side you're on. And, and this is a thing that's very true for actors, but also for the producing side. Horror just captivates everyone, no matter what region of the world you're in. And I think that's so amazing. I mean, just like um, action movies do the same. It, there's something about horror action movies that no matter where, who you are, you can, you still jump, you're still scared of it. It still gets a reaction out of people. And that's always great to see across the board. Do you like playing villains or victims more? You actually played a victim for me on a short film where you were stabbed to death. Yeah, that was that was fun. Uh, getting stabbed. That's another time I, I've died uh, on camera, which is I have so many of those. <laughs> um, honestly, playing the villain is a lot more fun. Um, playing the victims obviously great because you get to really bring out some cool emotions. Um, but we all like to play the bad guy. We all like to you know strangle, kill somebody. It, it's <laughs> it's a safe way to get that out. <laughs> it's all fake. Hope. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, you co-produced a film called Slapface, and you also played Deputy Shepard. So tell yes. us about that. Tell us about that project and how you got involved. Uh, Slapface is uh, my pride and joy right now. Um, I got involved with that whew, probably about a little over a year ago. Um, my best friend, who's also my producing partner, uh, Mike Manning, we. We're just looking for a film we wanted to do together. You know, we both loved horror. We both wanted something that we could really uh, shine on because we both knew horror was it's kind of our thing. We liked it so much. Um, and we met, uh, well, Mike introduced me to the director, Jeremiah Kipp. He's done, you know, tons of horror films. So I was like, this has got to be a good script. It turned out to be fucking amazing. Uh, I can cuss, right? I can cuss me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Fuck it all. Um, so... Yeah, we, I read the script. I absolutely fell in love with it. It's such a creepy, um, mesmerizing tale. It, it ties in. It's like a, a very The Witch um, monster movie. That's It's not straight up slasher horror like mm -hmm. so many people expect from all horror films. It's, it's creepy. It draws you into the drama first, and then you discover there's something creeping behind you that's going to kill you. Those are actually usually my kind of my favorite kind of horror films, the ones that mix that present life normally, the mundane details of life, and then the horror sneaks up out of that. It makes usually makes the horror seem more realistic when it it does happen. One thing I wanted to ask you was on you have uh, William Sadler in this film, correct? <laughs> um, we did. 
Oh, uh, okay. So what happened? He, we had William Sadler. Um, he had a scheduling conflict. Um, I, I don't know what film he got brought on to, but it, it was a bigger project than ours. So uh, we actually didn't end up using him. We got Dan Hadia, who uh, everybody's like, I know that name. Why do I know that name? Everybody, they have some reason cannot picture him. As soon as I show them his IMDb, they recognize him. They're like naming the 30,000 things he's been in. He's been uh, in probably more, this is actually true. He's been in more films than I've been years alive. So <laughs> he's, he's a legendary veteran actor. Uh, he's. New York actor, so we were, you know, so grateful that he took time out of his day to come, you know, film with us. He played our sheriff, um, who is a uh, a father figure to two of our characters, and he just killed it. No pun intended. Yep, pretty awesome. He's worked with uh, the Coen Brothers <laughs> and David Lynch. He's on Blood <laughs> Simple and Mulholland Drive. Those yes. are actually two of my favorite movies, so that's pretty awesome that you got him to. Yeah. Mulholland Drive, it, it, it's a legendary film, so just to get to work with a legend like that, I I was like, uh, I was like behind the camera just being like, don't panic, don't panic, he's not, okay, I'm, I'm freaking out. <laughs> yeah. So, can you tell us anything about the monster? Uh, let me think. The monster, so I, I guess I'll give you a little bit of a, a breakdown of what the movie is. Mm -hmm. Um. The movie centers around uh, our main character. His name's Lucas. Um, he's played by August Maturo, who's in The Nun. Absolutely, again, every actor on our set killed it. So um, it, it's around, it's about August, uh, Lucas. Um, he goes through a traumatic event uh, with his parents. Uh, he loses them. And because of that, he ends up befriending this monster in the woods um, who in turn just wreaks havoc on his life. Now, what I can tell you uh, about the creature in the wood, it, it's more of a, uh, a folklore type creature. So it's not, again, this isn't like a slasher, uh, Freddy vs. Jason type film. This is something that's much deeper. It derives in the fact of, you know, something mystical, something uh, very ancient and old. So it comes across in a way kind of like I was like, oh God, I'm trying to think of a good example. There's not really a lot of examples out there, which I kind of like. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I can't really say too much about it because a lot of the premise of the movie derives around, you know, the witch's involvement in the kid's life. So I can't really tell you too much about it, but I will say it's a folklore creature um, and it, it gets pretty nasty and pretty bloody. So that's going to be fun. Cool. How did you land August Maduro for the role or what made you guys go, decide to go with him? Um, we went with August. We were actually grateful to get him. Uh, we auditioned a few of the younger actors and he's was top of our list. I mean, he was in uh, Girl Meets World and that was already like, he showed he could do a little bit more of like the, the normal mundane, like regular acting, the, you know, the somewhat drama. He can do a little bit of comedy, the dry humor, which we wanted. Um, and then we saw him in The Nun and that was, it's hard to find young actors at that age range, you know, the 10 to 13, 14, that can really depict a good horror, and especially as a lead, to carry that. Uh, so when we saw him in The Nun, we knew he had it. It was like, hands down, he was our choice. Um, and then on top of that, I'm just gonna throw it out there. We had such an ensemble of cast that, uh, like I mentioned, Dan Hadia, Mike Manning is in it as well. Um, my, he's my producing partner. He was one of our main stars, he killed it. Um, we had the D'Ambrosio twins, Bianca and Chiara. They are uh, really big on Disney, Nickelodeon. They are the two bullies in the film. And they, uh, they again, they choosing this word again, they wreak havoc on uh, Lucas. They do it so well. You guys are going to love them. They're great villain characters that have uh, some great twists and turns in their stories as well. So what are the plans of, the, of this film as far as uh, a festival run, uh, distribution? What's going on with that? Um, so right now, as far as our plans for the, the slap face film, um, we are in post. We're pretty much done with editing. I've seen a few cuts now and it's amazing. Uh, so we're about to move into special effects, do all that fun stuff. And then once that's done, we were already talking to a few places as far as distribution. Um, we're obviously going to hit, you know, uh, the bigger markets first and see, you know, if we have any catches. Uh, right now, there's already a few people that reached out to us, I can say that 
seemed interested. So that's good news. We're on the right track from our, our teaser trailer we sent them. Uh, and it's going to go from there. Honestly, whoever picks it up distribution wise will change the route of what we do. Uh, if we, you know, don't find any big distribution uh, companies to take it on, we're going to hit the festivals. We're going to hit every horror festival we possibly can because this is, uh, again, a different type of horror that most people like to dive into. It's not your typical slasher film, so I think it'll do very well in festivals. Are you hoping for a theatrical release for this movie, or would you be okay with like a VOD release, given everything that's been going on with our current situation? Um, I would love a theatrical release. Now, honestly, no theaters open up anytime soon unless you're wearing a giant bubble suit. Um, it's inevitable, I would say, that it's going to end up in theaters. I, I, I'm pushing that for hardcore, or pushing that hardcore. Um, our other producers really want that as well. So I think that's definitely in the playing cards. Um, I, I'd love to see it obviously on a Netflix or Amazon, depending on our distributors. Uh, right now, we're in such an odd era of content needed, being needed. So we're in a good place as far as, you know, talking to these bigger uh, companies as far as getting it like on Netflix, stuff like that. So if it's not in theaters near you, it'll be in a, you know, a living room near you. You're one of the stars of a movie that I wrote and directed that uh, we just started entering in festivals. So uh, what drew you to that project? What made you want to come audition for it? Uh, <laughs> so this is gonna be a fun discussion. Um, I actually, <laughs> I mean, you guys actually know this, but I, I mean, I auditioned for the main villain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that that's what drew me in. Again, this was something we even talked about earlier. I love playing villains. Uh, that's mm -hmm. typically what I do. You know, which is ironic because I mean I have you can't really see it, but there's a Deadpool poster behind me that I or a painting that I made. Um, I'm a superhero guy, like that's what I love, but I'm always the villain. So that's why I came in for uh, for pay up your guys' film. It was a chance to play a villain. Even if I didn't get it, I was like, Hell yeah, I'm gonna audition for this. This is a fun role to play. So why not? And you guys were kind enough to, you know, reach back out to me, give me a different role, which I had a blast filming. Uh, I didn't play a villain, but I got to do my other favorite thing, which was die on camera. So <laughs> my mom loves always seeing that. <laughs> well, well you, you came in, we were all kind of blown away by you. And we, we actually weighed casting you as the villain. And we went, we, it took a long time before we decided to give you the role that, you gave, that we gave you. But the three of us that were there in the casting all said that no matter what happens, we have to have this guy in the movie in some capacity. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, but once, what, once we chose another actor as a villain, everybody agreed that we're like, no matter what, we're gonna have to put Nick in another role and it has to be a big one. So that's why we gave you John. <laughs> well, it was definitely a, a fun role to play. Um, the getting paired up uh, with some of the great actors that were in your guys' film, where it was it was fun. There was great chemistry the entire time. You guys were always amazing to work with. The script is amazing, so I, I really am excited to see um, what you guys do with it in the end. Like it, it's going to be amazing no matter what. Yeah. Well, the, the the reason why we were able to get through it like we did, we did it in about five and a half days. It's a feature film, and one of the reasons we did that, one of the big reasons, is because you and Adam. Did a 21 pages of script in one day. Yeah, that was. So how how was that challenge? That uh, may have given me a stroke at one point uh, before I got to set. <laughs> because I mean, me and him, thankfully, we rode up there together to set, which was I think it was like an hour and a half drive or something. So we were just doing again and again and again. So we we thankfully uh, we had a little bit of time before filming. So I mean, me and him both knew our lines by heart. Um, it was pretty much came down to chemistry, just feeding off of each other. And again, I mean, it goes down to the writing too. When writing flows and it just makes sense, it's things you would normally say, even though it was a crazy circumstance. Um, it was just easy to memorize and easy to get off, you know, off the page. So that goes to you guys. Actually, it's to my question. You guys did really did seem like friends, and, and you you set the tone for the whole movie. I think, and uh, and you really nailed your part, and, and I I thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, I hate the bastard, but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was amazing to work with. You're in uh, the film that Mike's film, the one uh, that I'm also producing, and you're also doing a lot of stuff as a producer. 
We're also working on another project with you up upcoming that you're going to be producing. Do you prefer the acting or producing duties? What excites you more at this point in your career? Um, right now, in my career, I would say uh, producing is a little bit more exciting. Not because acting is any less more exciting. Um, acting still has that edge for me, but I've just been doing it for so long that producing is, I've been doing it for a few years, but acting is just like, it's like changing it up what you're driving car wise. Like I'm going from driving this car to this car. Like it's good to change it up every once in a while. Um, granted, I've done the producing and the acting thing at the same time. It's not as easy as people think. Um, I know Ben Affleck likes to gloat about how good he is at doing both. Mm -hmm. um, but both have their their different part of, of art and creativity. Like it's, Producing is very artsy still. A lot of people just think it's all numbers, but it's very uh, technical in what you do and craft-wise. Acting has its own side to it. I mean, obviously, you're building characters totally different, but to me, getting to play and do both things, and, you know, outside of that, I also do editing. So, like, I'm just, I like to be well-rounded. You wouldn't go into a job interview saying you've only had one job in your life. You wouldn't go to set saying you only know how to do one thing. The more you know, it helps you in all those fields. Being a producer helps me in acting. Acting helps me in producing. Being an editor helps me in all two, and you know, in both of those and anything else I might do. So it's good to be well rounded. And I wouldn't say there's one I enjoy more than the other. You talked about why you were drawn to the horror genre. So what's the first horror film you can recall that truly affected you? <laughs> um, this is oh god, this is embarrassing. Um, there's two, and. One is actually Freddy versus Jason, which was, I mean, I, it came out in the time. I mean, before that, all the other ones, I wasn't old enough to, I wasn't allowed to see yet. It was my parents. Um, and I wasn't supposed to be watching Freddy versus Jason either. I was like, I think 13 or 12, something like that. Um, my brother put it on. And of course, my mom walked in and, you know, threw a shoe at his head. But that kind of set the tone for watching slasher flicks, watching slasher flicks and getting to see like, these can be fun, they can be funny, they can be gory, um, they can actually have a story to them that's not just, you know, a woman tripping over uh, a, a shoe or a guy, you know, doing something dumb and getting killed in the corner. Like, there's a lot more to slasher flicks. And the other one uh, was Anaconda. Oh, uh, that, <laughs> that, one, uh, that one scarred me. I, I have a, I don't have a fear of snakes, I would say. I just greatly dislike them. <laughs> um, so Anaconda, when that came out, that kind of scarred me. I was every time I turned off the lights, I was like, "There's a giant snake somewhere in my room. Like, what is going on?" <laughs> it didn't make no sense, but it was a, it was a fear when I was young. So that one definitely changed it. Um, and then over time, you know, I, I've watched a lot of of horror films. Uh, American Werewolf in London was a great one. I, I rewatched it recently, actually. So that one, you know, took me back. So I would say. Probably those two, and then there's a lot more that have shaped me, but those two did the most. You have actually have a friendship with the filmmaker Michael Doherty, the director of Krampus and the perennial Halloween favorite, Trick or Treat. How did you meet uh, Michael, and how did that friendship start? Um, so this is, a, this is a funny one. Um, one of my good friends, uh, his name's Tom, we, um, he invited me to a game night. He was just like, hey man, we, it's you know Thursday night or something, I don't remember what it was. He was like, come to my buddy Mike's house, we're gonna, we're gonna play games. So I showed up at you know, his house, which is literally decorated as you would expect, very horror, very, uh, very creepy castle-like, which I love, I thought it was amazing. I'm like, I'm buying your house one day if I can ever afford it. Um, and we just hit it off. Me and him have a lot of similar interests as far as horror, but then outside of that, you know, he's, he's a nerd, he's, a geek he loves the weird creepy stuff i'm into uh egyptian stuff a little bit and he has you know tons of shit all around his house that is egyptian so that was fun to check out um and probably i think i may have told you guys this story but the most memorable thing about him that from that night uh was i'm absolutely terrified this is another film that scarred me when i was younger that was poor that kind of got me into it uh it was the exorcism um and i went in to go use the bathroom during game night and he has a, a life-size doll of the exorcism in the bathroom with glass eyes, it's too real. Uh, I literally screamed like a 12 year old. I ran out of the bathroom, everybody's laughing. Uh, so I go back into the bathroom and I am peeing 
and staring holes through this doll. Like it is, if it moves, I was ready to kick it straight through the door. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I swear it twitched. Everybody says it didn't because it's not real. But so I finished going to the bathroom and I'm like, I did it. Yeah. I open the door. I step out and I'm like, yeah, guys, he has a second doll that he placed outside the door. Oh, so as soon as I open the door, I see another one. I karate chop it and I flip <laughs> over the couch and fall on the floor and everybody was dying laughing. So that was that was my night. That was my introduction to Mike. And uh, <laughs> ever since then, we, we've been great friends. Um, I was actually chatting with him yesterday. Uh, you have to be a little careful with chatting with him because he's always trying to prank you on everything. He is, as much as I like to think I'm a prankster, he is the king of pranks. So I, I've learned my lesson to stay away from him on that. <laughs> You've done, uh, you also have a following on uh, various social media for cosplaying as Nightwing. Am I correct? That is correct. <laughs> yes. So uh, is this a dream role for you, Nightwing? Yeah, um, it was definitely for a long time. It was a dream role of mine. I started actually doing a something that most people had never thought of doing before. Um, I, I was approached by like casting directors and stuff, and they were like, "This is new." I started campaigning for the role. Um, I started posting as the character, um, not literally like I'm Nightwing. I was posting like I was the actor that was like going to represent him, um, and that I wanted to play as him. Uh, this was back when Titans, the TV show, was still in development, and they were talking about doing a Nightwing movie. Um, so I built a, a very large fan base cosplaying him, and you know, kind of promoting myself as an actor for him. Uh, and ironically, I think six months or so before the show started, they already made their casting decisions and everything. You know, I, I heard from the grapevine, you know, who they had picked, um, and it, it wasn't me. They they knew very well of me, but they wanted somebody with a little more credit. Um, they actually started taking my photo. Uh, I had one of me as Nightwing, you know, it's a Titan on it and stuff like that. And they started using it for their own advertising. So that was a little bit of a slap in the face, uh, but it was great publicity. And everybody said, why don't you sue Warner Brothers? Why don't you sue DC? And I was like, I want to work for them one day. Like, I, I think I, somebody down the line on the lower ranks fucked up and used my photo. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not going after the heads of Warner Brothers or DC. Um, once I, once they were informed about what was going on, they took the photo down and realized, you know, they'd made mistakes. So it, it's, it's still a, uh, a dream role of mine. Obviously the TV show is not going to happen now. Um, I've had talks with people that work in the, in the production company. They obviously would love to use me for something else. I'm like, okay, I'll play a villain again. So that would be fun. Um, and I'd still obviously love to play Nightwing in a movie. We'll just we'll see what happens if I don't get too old. That is okay. So if what I'm happened just... with what happened with uh, Deceit, the uh, short film that you wrote and directed and edited? Uh, Deceit did its festival rounds. Um, it probably I think it, I won. Uh, I was in twenty something festivals. I think I won like twelve awards on that one. So I was very proud of you know, the accomplishments, especially on a short film. Um, that one pretty much got pushed to the side because uh, I got busy with other projects. Um, but I, I flushed out a full feature script on that one and I started uh, fundraising for it and I started trying to get more funds with it. And then obviously uh, COVID happened. So that one got put on hold. Um, there's not really a whole lot of people looking to invest in films right now until this clears up a little bit, but it's definitely still on the slate for hopefully next year because I don't know how much is going to get done this year now. There's your puppy. That's <laughs> He's he's, nice. he's on some CBD THC medicine right now, so he's just like. <laughs> Are you a proponent of weed? Oh yes, I, I'm a huge advocate for weed. It's I know too many people that uh, have benefited from it. They, I, I'm working closely with some some very high end people in the THC field, uh, doctors, um, that. It's moving along very quickly as far as progression in weed in the world. Um, the UK, Africa, everybody's starting to actually realize the propaganda that was behind cannabis in the uh, the 1930s and 40s after the war. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen Reefer Madness. Of course. Yeah. Um, so you know the propaganda that was all behind that. It's all bullshit. Uh, so I, I am a big advocate for weed. I think it's, it's a great medication. I, I'm not a huge advocate for those that love to smoke just to, you know, become a, a vegetable on the couch 
I think that's a waste of time. You know, you have a lot more potential than that, but it, it's a great medicine for so many things um, from stress, anxiety, PTSD. Um, there's supposedly links to Alzheimer's. I mean, there's so many things I, I can't speak on because I don't know that well, but I, I love weed. I don't, I don't really smoke by myself. Um, I'm a diabetic, so I can't because it, it just affects diabetics differently. As far as I know, I haven't had, I get way too high, but for everybody else I know that smokes weed for medical reasons, it's been a godsend. Besides our page work, we're, we're of course gonna report on anything that happens with Slap Face and any of your other projects coming up, but where can people see any uh, updates on your projects and everything? On your social uh, media? As far as my projects, anything I'm going on uh, right now, I, I've been sucked into TikTok. Um, nothing on there is gonna be film related. It, it's pretty much just me being an idiot. Um, so you can find me on TikTok, uh, Instagram. I post a lot of stuff as far as, you know, my personal life, but I also post a good bit, uh, if there's ever news with any films I'm doing, anything I'm in, I love to post articles. I love to promote. So that's definitely something you can find me on. Um, and I have a few Facebook pages as far as that goes. Uh, I post some stuff and then I have my website, not really updated that in a while. It's mostly my acting website. So you won't see too much producing, uh, posts and stuff like that on there. Yeah. All right, so we'll we'll put those links along with this episode so people can click on them. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw links at you guys. Cool. Before you go, what is your favorite horror movie? Shit. Hmm. Let me think about this one. Or a couple of favorites, if you had to narrow it down to a few. I know it's hard to pick one movie over anything else. You know, this is this is weird because. Like I said, so horror films to me are meant to really creep you out. I don't. I think if if something doesn't change in you after seeing it, then it didn't do its job. Like obviously, I don't want to see a horror movie and walk out being like that wasn't scary at all. Now the the Exorcist of Emily Rose I saw when I was like fourteen. Um, I'm still terrified of it. Like I said, I'm scared of all the Exorcism movies, but I think that's one of my favorite because it really did such a good job of capturing the whole, like the fear of that realm of like possession and stuff like that. Um, outside of that, a recent one that I really, really, really loved was A Quiet Place. Um, it, it's the editing, I, like I said, I do editing and stuff like that as well. So the the style in which they did it, which is obviously almost silent, they should have won an award for their sound. Hands down, they were nominated, they didn't win sadly. Um, yeah. But that, that film just creeped me out because it's such a, a weird twist on a, a new horror genre. Like we almost went back in time to like a silent film in a present day with like monsters and stuff. It was just so interesting and cool. I love the style that they did that in. Um, obviously I have a lot of other uh, horror films that I love. Krampus, Trick or Treat, I'll throw those in there for Mike so he doesn't kill me. Do you have any advice for anybody trying to make it as an actor? Advice on being an actor? Um, Follow your gut, follow your heart. Uh, it, it's not an easy route. Think of it as going to college, going to school. Um, the days of people coming here and picking up a job just because you know some producer saw them walking down the street, it's very rare. I'm not gonna say it's impossible because it could happen, but you have to think of it as a job. It, you spend time going to school, you need to learn, you need to study, you need to spend the four to eight years to 12 years you know, grinding those gears, learning, your craft um but i also hear a lot of people say you know if you don't make it by you know 25 you don't make it by 30 by 35 and like obviously it's always changing that's not true there's so many actors that i see like i mean i'm i'm 28 now i i don't consider myself to be the most veteran actor um and i i wouldn't say that i, I fully made it yet like i have a lot of things that i want to accomplish but i'm doing what i love and that's what you want to do do it being an actor doesn't mean you're making you know millions of dollars and you're living in a mansion being an actor means you're doing the thing you love for the craft and for the art and that's the reason you should be doing it and just don't give up no matter your age your gender your your anything we'd like to thank you so much for coming on the show nick and uh, we look forward to showcasing your talent and pay up coming up in festivals later on this year and uh, yeah. thanks again yeah, of course. I had a blast. You guys are amazing. Always to chat with. Um, I can't wait to see it pay up. So uh, we I'll can't wait to see it on the ground. <laughs> we can't wait to see Flatface, actually. Yeah, yeah. that's going to be fun. <laughs>
I will definitely keep everybody updated. There'll be tons of posts. Like I said, we're in we're in post production right now. We're about to move into uh, special effects and uh, and sound and scoring it, which is always fun. So we're we're on the tail end. We're almost done. Cool. All right, Nick. There, everybody. Thank you for your time. Horror show exclusive. Well, we hope you enjoyed that interview with Nick Thurr, because next up, we're going to be talking about the latest documentary series on Shudder that is all the buzz right now, Cursed Films. I really enjoyed this one. It's basically a documentary series. It's it's actually a full documentary. It, it's five episodes that end up being a, around an hour 30, hour 40 minutes, so it's about the length of a movie. And they cover uh, The Exorcist, Poltergeist, The Omen, the Crow and Twilight Zone, the movie. And what I liked about these series is that uh, each episode, uh, the the fact that each episode's focus is completely different means that the types of stories that you get out of them are completely different. There's, there's more, uh, like for example, on the Omen set, there's more there to suggest that there was a haunting on the set and there's more reason to feed off of speculation. Whereas on films like, say, the Twilight Zone or the Poltergeist series, those, or even The Crow, those are unfortunately just riddled with very bad accidents or unfortunate yeah. production, unfortunate production well, happening. This was a pretty fascinating series altogether, but uh, th there was some problems I had with it as far as, um, there's parts of it where it did benefit from separating the documentary into, the, into each film. But there's also things that that go in the context of the documentary as a whole, mm -hmm. like when they explain uh, why people believe in curses, or they explain uh, exorcisms and why people believe in them, why they don't. So there's a lot of that stuff weaved in there that that fits into the context of the entire documentary. But within the context of that episode in particular, it seems like a, a deviation from the subject. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I would recommend just because the way that it's it goes, like you said, it's almost like a feature length film. I would recommend anybody who watches it, watches it from the beginning to the end, because you'll have a lot more context. Because if you start, like, I get what you mean, because talking about the curses on some of the other parts does seem a little bit out of place within the context of one film. I didn't notice it until you brought it up, but that's only because I, I watched it all in one sitting. So it kind of all blended together for me. And I think that's the best way to watch it. Yeah, and, and especially since, you know, you and I are both hardcore horror fans. So a lot of this we already knew. Mm -hmm. So it's it's good to, to mix in uh, some other elements into, instead of just straight telling the stories of these movies, they're mixing other elements in there to make it interesting for us the people who've uh, heard all this over and over again. And we'll start with The Exorcist. Now for The Exorcist, they had Linda Blair, which is probably the most important one to talk to about this. Uh, Eileen Dietz, uh, some professors of, of religious studies, an exorcist, an occult book author, journalists and film critics. And uh, they, talk, they talk about stuff where there was a fire on the set and, and uh, Reagan's room was not touched. Uh, Linda Blair and Ellen Burstyn both got injured pretty bad, but I think that was mostly the director. Uh, and a real killer, they talked about the real killer who was in the CAT scan scene. Uh, they went into, they dove into the audience reaction in theaters, how it was making people faint and, and uh, throw up. And, uh, and one of the most fascinating parts of it was when Linda Blair was talking about needing bodyguards after the movie. Because people were so convinced that it was cursed and so convinced that it was tied to uh, uh, evil spirits that she was in fear for her life. And it was so bad that she couldn't even talk about it. They asked her about needing guards around her 24 7 after the movie. And she said, I won't even talk about some of the stuff that happened. Let's just say it was bad. What I found interesting about The Exorcist one, it shows you a cultural phenomenon that I don't think is ever going to be repeated again. The impact that The Exorcist had on culture is not something that you could ever replicate, and I doubt we're going to have ever have a horror movie that's as legendary as The Exorcist is, because if you put it in the context of the time, it nobody had ever seen anything like it. And my whole thing with The Exorcist, and to me what makes it such an effective horror movie, is it takes supernatural events and gives them a very 
gives them a very tangible physicality. It has an almost documentary-like approach to what you're seeing where the special effects don't look like special effects. It just looks like you're watching footage unfold. And now that I've seen the actual documentary, I know why it has such a physicality to it. It's yeah. because William Friedkin really pushed this really far. And one of the, the interesting points of this documentary is that a lot of the films, not all of them, but a lot of the films that we're talking about were made in the 1970s or the 1980s. This was a completely different era for films. And like they said, it was like the Wild, the wild West back then. When I mean, you think about 70s productions like Apocalypse Now, which when you really think about it, a movie like Apocalypse Now should not have been made the way it was because they yeah. actually went and they bombed an actual village and tore it apart. It was about the hue back then the director was like God, there was no oversight, and every bit, the directors kind of bought into their own myths, their own legend, their hubris. So William Friedkin did things on the set that if they were to happen on a film production now, that director would probably get canceled on Twitter and there would be a lot of pushback. Like for example, when the, I was pretty shocked when I found out that uh, Linda Blair, when she's being harnessed back and forth on the bed that she actually fractured her spine, it made me look at the scene a little bit differently now when I look at him like, fuck, that looks like it's like it's painful. Uh, Especially since they used the take that she got injured on. So yeah. the, when you're watching that happen on scene, you're watching her spine get fractured. And it's very painful. So like I said, now I know why the film possesses such a, a that physicality to it. It's because Friedkin really pushed all of the actors on the set to go far actually fired a gun off on the set which i was not aware of i didn't know that when ellen burst in like the moment when she's in the room and she gets pulled back i didn't know that she was actually pulled back that aggressively and was actually hurt but that's i guess why it makes the scene so effective it comes from an era of movies where the rules were a lot different and granted i'm I'm happy these movies exist because they've created the 1970s and 1980s have given us some of the greatest films in the history of the medium. But I do think it's a good thing that people have calmed down on how they treat people on set because at the end of the day, these are just movies and it's not worth injuring or hurting people to get them made. There's ways to make things more effective without actually fracturing somebody's spine or yeah. injuring them by actually throwing up against the wall. And God forbid, firing off a gun on the set to scare somebody. Yeah. <laughs> well, extreme, like, extreme like, like Linda Blair said, it wasn't just some Yahoo shooting guns off on the set. It, you know, it, she, he done so many things that she would not have normally put up with and these actors would not have normally subjected themselves to. But because they seen his passion and all his passion came from not wanting to deliberately hurt anybody to get a good shot, but pushing them to their limits to get the best results possible. And and like the the one the two accidents with uh, with Linda Blair and with Ellen Burstyn, they were more than just onset accidents. They were willfully uh, pushed in that direction. Pushed in that direction by the director. And. This is something that's it's a bit more inexcusable in one of the later movies we'll talk about. But in here, I think it's a little more understandable, I guess. It comes closer to being justified than the last film in the documentary series. And we'll get to that eventually because I have because, a lot to say about that. Yeah. Because uh, The Exorcist, I mean, it went, it went, it's still down in history as one of the greatest horror films ever made and one of the greatest films, period, and one of the most effective. So uh, I, I guess some, I mean, Linda Blair actually talked like it was worth it to her. Mm -hmm. She says that she wouldn't be the person that she was, that she is now if she didn't go through these traumatic experiences on The Exorcist. And I think what's more traumatic for her wasn't the actual filming, it was the reaction that she got from the public. And I think that's the problem with talking about cursed films in a certain context or saying that it's cursed because you're putting something on the actors and the people involved that they might not be comfortable with. I don't think it's fair that a little girl had to live with the stigma that she's actually evil just because she acted in a, acted in a film and because people yeah. take it way too seriously. I think there's some level of damage of trying to make too much of a conspiracy out of what happened on the set. I just yeah. view it as a director who went a little bit overboard. The interesting thing though, 
which is fucking weird. I was already aware of this, but the fact that there is a real killer in the movie who is actually one of the lab techs is actual a real a real lab tech ended yeah. up murdering a variety journalist and chopping them up. That's a really freaky detail. When you combine those accidents like that and the fact that there's a serial killer and then the fact that it's The Exorcist, how people thought the film was actually evil. People thought that by watching it that you are inviting the devil into your life. People thought that there was actual evil in the celluloid. That combined with the onset accidents, uh, Linda Blair's treatment, and of course having a real life murderer on the set is only going to help heighten the urban legend surrounding The Exorcist and its production. Yeah, and, and this is one, I do not think it's cursed because a lot of the stuff came from... The director? Yeah, the director and, ju and just random things. It, it didn't seem cursed to me, but it was sad in a way, especially the way they ended off. And I love the way they went from The Exorcist to The Poltergeist. And then they ended... Uh, the exorcist portion with Linda Blair talking about where she wouldn't even talk about uh, needing guards. And it kind of gives you this sadness that, that people were that delusional and that she had to put up with this in order to be in this classic movie. And then that sadness carries over into Poltergeist, which is another film that's not cursed. I don't think it's cursed in any way. It's just horribly tragic. Mm -hmm. And, and, what you really see in this documentary is, is just how deep the tragedy went and how deeply sad it is. And on this one, they had uh, they talked to horror fans, podcasters, authors, journalists, and uh, makeup. And most importantly, the makeup effects, effects artist Craig Reardon and director of Part Three Gary Sherman. Now, on this one, they talked about uh, the boy being choked. Uh, in the scene with the clown, how he was really choked because the, the arm wrapped a little bit too tight around his neck. The result they of talk about, Yeah, and of course the skeletons in the pool being real skeletons and people thought that that's where the curse came from, which is ridiculous. And uh, uh, I thought it was pretty freaky. I didn't know this, that the, the actor that played Kane in part two, Reverend Kane, he died and then they used his death mask in part three. So not only they used... Uh, that actor's death mask in part three, they also had to replace Carol Ann, Heather O'Rourke's character at the end because she died before they finished filming it. And there was a couple things, and, and they, um, of course they talked about uh, Dominique Dunn being killed by her boyfriend. But the saddest thing about this, I thought, was uh, Carol Ann's story because her life was cut so short. And then knowing, that, you know, how she had those signature little chubby cheeks in yeah. the movies. The fact that that was because of her condition and she was blown up like that makes it so much sadder to me. And I didn't know on part three that once Heather O'Rourke died, the director and the producer said, okay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna finish this movie. It's devastating. I can't even imagine finishing this movie. And they were forced to because they were con contractually obligated. So their careers would have been over if they hadn't finished it. And just seeing the sadness in their face and the tears in their eyes when they talked about being forced to finish this movie and looking in that, at that little girl dressed like Heather O'Rourke. It was just so morbid. And they kind of forced an ending that didn't make sense. And I actually personally love Poltergeist 3, but it's the ending is the only thing that kind of throws it off. Mm -hmm. and, it, and watching this made it even sadder. I think this is also the episode that most demonstrates how sometimes spread, spreading conspiracies about a possible curse is hurtful to the people who are involved and how it undercuts the very real tragedies that people suffered. For example, when they talk about the skeletons being used, that's not thing that's unique in Hollywood. The special effects designer on that film mentions that even going back to old William Castle films or movies like House on Haunted Hill, they used real skeletons back then. And that's because you can get uh, those from labs and it's pretty cheap. Little cheap B-movie productions or cheaper productions are not going to pay to have a new skeleton molded. And to yeah. say that this little girl died because of a skeleton is a little bit disrespectful to her memory. And the other one, she was actually strangled by her boyfriend. That yeah. is terribly tragic. It's very heartbreaking. It's really sad. That guy, who's her boyfriend who strangled her, never, as far as I'm concerned, justice was not served in that case. 
And it's very unfortunate that a, a young life was cut so short because somebody couldn't hold their temper in or they thought it was okay to put their hands on a woman like that. Yeah. And when you start spreading stories about how, oh, it's because of the skeletons, because of this, you're undercutting the memory of these people and you're undercutting the very real tragedies that they suffered. Heather O'Rourke died because they misdiagnosed her stomach issues. They thought that she had Crohn's disease, so they were treating her for Crohn's disease. What she actually had was a blockage that eventually exploded and all the toxins uh, sent her body into shock and killed her. It's a simple mis a medical misdiagnosis and it's... Uh, that lies on the responsibility of the doctors who were in charge of trying to get her better. And the special effects artist on the Poltergeist has sp spoken how he feels it's personally insulting. All the hard work that he put into this film is blamed for the deaths of, uh, the deaths of two of its stars, which is not fair. And it puts an, an, ugly, stigma, uh, an, an ugly stigma around things. Yeah, it does. That one was definitely heartbreaking to sit through because of the stories they felt, what, what, what people went through on the set. And as far as the clown choking the kid, technology malfunctions. I mean, fuck, last week when we were doing this podcast with David Howard Thornton, we couldn't get it going all the way. All the, We couldn't get it going. It kept going. The Zoom kept going in and out. And we were able to edit together and put good, into a good podcast. But technology malfunctions, that's just part of yeah. it. It doesn't mean that the film was cursed and that the the kid was being strangled because the film that they were doing i don't buy that at all and yeah. i think it undercuts the artistry that's on display in the film as well and this is actually one of a handful of times in this documentary series that the people being interviewed actually make you feel bad about thinking that these films are cursed mm -hmm. especially ones like the poltergeist and twilight zone and the crow yeah but then the one they did next, it's it's funny how they, they follow up Poltergeist with The Omen, where some of the shit on there, it seems like it was cursed. So The Omen, the Omen I will say this, out of the five movies that they cover, the five series that they cover, The Omen has the creepiest stories, the ones that the ones that are most ripe for urban legends and to believe it's cursed, because some of what happened would freak anybody out. Even the most rational person who didn't believe in curses or didn't have any form of spirituality would pause and really think about exactly what happened with all that, with on, offset and what happened with the, with the actors' lives. It's hard not to think about it. And I think this one was also especially uh, fascinating because of the uh, guests that they used, because they also used uh, Professor Religious Studies on this one, but they also used... Uh, two black magicians, including Nate Bales, that guy was entertaining as hell. A witch, uh, the director Richard Donner, executive producer Mace Newfield, and a publisher of Skeptic Magazine. So on this one, uh, they talked about Gregory Peck and the executive producer Mace Newfield were on planes that were struck by lightning. And then there was the baboon scene where the uh, car broke down in the middle of this big bag baboon sanctuary and baboon when you see baboons attacking the car they really did attack it and then the animal handler ends up getting eaten by tigers uh the effects artist john richardson was in a car crash where the passenger was beheaded much like the scene in the movie and he looked at a nearby road sign said omen 66.6 kilometers it was a it was a nearby town called omen o-m-m-e-n and it was 66.6 kilometers away, but it was right there by the, the crash. And also a plane that was chartered, but switched at the last minute, crashed, killing everyone on board. That ha that was tied to the production. And then, uh, so this one, they do a lot of uh, analyzing why people believe in curses and why they believe in supernatural things. So they, they did a f kind of fascinating exercise in perception on here, where the guy says something pretty cool with the word, we see things that aren't there, and then we miss things that are. He illustrated that by showing a group of people throwing a basketball back and forth. Some of them had black t-shirts, some of them had white t-shirts, and they, they wanted you to count how many times people in black t-shirts passed the ball to each other. So you're counting it while a guy in a monkey suit comes right in front of the, in the middle of the screen and dances around and keeps walking. And I don't know about you, but I didn't see that. 
I that actually kind movie. of blew my mind. I had to. I thought I was being tricked by the documentary for a second, so I actually had to re rewind. But while I was counting, trying to count how many times the people in the black shirts passed the ball together, I totally missed a man in an ape suit walking by. And what makes it worse is when you look at it, it's right in the middle of the frame. It's not hidden in the corners. It is so blatantly right there. You're like, how the hell did I miss a fucking ape? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> through this thing. So that did kind of blow my mind. One thing I wish this documentary clarified a little bit more. You know the scene with the baboons attacking? Yeah. And they end up using it in the movie. Was that not supposed to happen in the, the, the movie? Because wasn't the point of them going to the zoo is to show that... Because the idea is that animals sense evil more than human beings do. The idea is that they're more receptive to it. That's why the idea that dogs bark when they see when somebody untrustworthy is around. Was that supposed to happen or was it not supposed to happen? Was it a lucky accident? And if not, what was the purpose of them going or filming in the zoo in the first place? I, That's the only thing I wish they clarified. I think maybe they were supposed to show the baboons getting agitated. I don't think they were all actually supposed to come up and attack the car. I so may be wrong. So that's hmm. if that's the case, then it's just simply of a case of the scene going even better than they could have ever initially expected. Because within the context of what's going on right there, it seems totally appropriate that the baboons would be attacking because it signals to the audience that the little kid in the car, Damien, is actually evil. So that was yeah. just a malfunction that I think probably benefits the film because they do actually look horrified. Yeah. Go back and look in the movie, now we know why. What I think is kind of cool about this documentary, they keep showing you evidence that these films are cursed and then tells you, shows you reasons why you should question what you see and question what you're told and not be so quick to call it a curse. Like, uh, like when they compared it to the assassination of John Lennon, how the assassination of John Lennon was based on a weird conspiracy theory that he thought that he was part of a curse. Really quick, this is not to trigger people. The documentary ended up being relevant in a different way because the the way that the guy the um was Mark David Chapman, his reasonings for killing John Lennon sound like have the same sort of logic that a lot of the conspiracy theories flying around right now have. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm not trying exactly. to say people. <laughs> but it illustrates how people can take things that are unrelated and just slap them together in their head. That means this happens, so this, this, and this means that. No, it doesn't always mean that. This uh, episode of the documentary is, is another one that ended on a fascinating note, where it had they were talking to Richard Donner, the, the director and the executive producer, Mace Newfield. They go through this whole episode, this evidence that it's cursed, and these crazy coincidences all this, all these tragedies that happen, and then they ask them at the very last of the episode, just as they're about to end, they ask, so do you think the film is cursed then? And they both said, no, I don't think it's cursed at all. It's blessed. Look what it did for us. <laughs> I thought that was a very interesting perspective to add at the end, because when they said, if it were really cursed, those actors would have been on the planes that the, the planes would have went down and Gregory Peck would have gotten on his original flight that would have would have went down. He said the fact that he avoided a he avoided a flight that eventually crashed and still survived when both people still survived when the planes were being struck by lightning. They uh, saw that as a sort of blessing, and I never considered it. But I mean, that's a good way of looking at it. If it, that's it's blessed that you could have had all of these uh, like Gregory Peck had two chances where he could have died in a horrible accident and he ended up surviving, suggesting that there was some more positive energy surrounding this movie than people care to give it credit for. Reasons that I don't like saying it's cursed and this is just a personal thing. As you saw with one of the priests there who said something, uh, uh, one of the exorcists who said something equally ridiculous that people who watch these films are spiritually compromising themselves and allowing evil into their lives. It allows you to people to spread the the belief that by you watching a film like The Omen, you're allowing evil into your life or you're letting darkness into your life. And like, no, that's not true and that's not fair to horror fans because a lot of horror fans, like I said before, are some of the nicest, sweetest, caring people in the world. 
And yeah. sometimes when you put these curses on them, you're implying things about horror fans that are not true. You're not compromised for watching a film like The Omen. The next episode, I looked on IMDb and The Crow episode is everyone's favorite episode, but it was my least favorite of the series. And I think it's because it's the one that's closest to my heart because I followed this very closely and they, they even mentioned Entertainment Weekly, which is what I read at the time because they followed the production every single week. There was a little column where they talked about the curse of the crow. Here's what happened this week on set. Mm -hmm. So I was fascinated by watching the whole thing because I was a huge fan of uh, Brandon Lee's action films already. So when, when and I love the, the crow comic book, so when I heard my one of my favorite action stars brandon lee is gonna do the crow i can't wait for this i waited with bated breath and that was it's probably the most devastating celebrity death of my life because i was so close to it and so invested in it but i think this was the one they took the least care on mm -hmm. on all the other ones they brought in all these people from the movie they brought in experts and people had some very good insight into it on the crow they brought Special effects makeup artist Lance Anderson, producer Jeff Most, and then just a couple authors and Ryan Turk. Mostly facts I already knew and people lecturing me, lecturing people who think it's a curse. That one in particular could have been explored a little bit more. I didn't feel the, the deep sadness of what a tragedy that was. I think they were doing too much lecturing on that one and not enough honoring of Bruce Lee, um, uh, Brandon Lee's memory. I don't see it that way. That's one of the ones I felt was most tragic, especially when Michael Berryman, who I wasn't even aware that he was originally supposed to be in the film, which I find kind of interesting. Yeah. Where they, they, I think they used a good example to show how a bullet could be lodged into a gun by accident and how even a blank could kill somebody or hurt somebody. They should have been on set checking that a lot more thoroughly and the yeah. studio should have not been cutting corners, especially when you have scenes that involve guns and where accidents could actually happen, there needs to be a little bit more care on set. And that's not even the worst example. Sadly enough, that's not even the worst example on here of carelessness on set. But I do think that if people were a little bit more thorough with the weapons, it's something that could have been avoided. And another thing, I wasn't aware that, that um, Bruce Lee died the way he did. I thought the way that he died, I thought he was actually shot. I didn't know that there was mysterious circumstances surrounding his death. That one is something that actually kind of caught me off guard. And I get the kind of sadness that Michael Berryman talks about where he feels that it's a, an unfortunate tragedy. And I mean, who knows what happens? what's happened on that set, but I think a lot of people don't want the people who are involved. And first off, I don't think a lot of people interviewed about that because the people who were involved with the production of The Crow are probably traumatized by what happened. Yeah. So it's a little bit harder to get people in on it. And it's a lot more recent than the Twilight Zone movie, which we'll get to later. I think there's too much raw pain for the people who were involved to come out and talk about it on the documentary. I could see as it was, Michael Berryman looked like he was on the verge of tears at times when he was talking about it. I think it's just for some people don't feel comfortable getting in front of a camera and talking about it. Because um, who was the actor who shot, who fired the gun? Uh, I forgot his name, but it's the one who played Fun Boy. Okay, Fun Boy. If I were that person, I would be scarred for life and it would be a long time before I could get in front of a camera again. If I, Even though it's not his fault that the gun went off or that it had something lodged into it that ultimately killed Brandon Lee, I think I would have a hard time getting in front of the camera and talking about it, even yeah, if, he, no matter he, how much time has passed. And it, he disappeared and went into seclusion for a couple of years after that, I think, where he was just completely cut off from the rest of the world. He just couldn't deal, and I understand. But I, I just think it, it spent a lot of time, I, I guess I'm biased towards it because it told me a lot of stuff that I already knew mm -hmm. and it didn't explore the stuff that I didn't know enough. I mean, all that all that talk about the logistics of the bullet came out, I knew every detail of that. I, I had looked into it at, at length. Mm -hmm. So I knew all about that and all that time they wasted on that, they could have went into what caused that on the set. I don't care, you know, I, I already know the logistics of what made that but, piece of lead come out of it, but I don't know what happened on set still. 
The thing is, but I don't think most people know the logistics. I wasn't even aware of the logistics. And while I get what you mean, we don't know what happened on set. It was filmed in 1993 and traumatic experiences like that, your mind tends to blur. To go back after all this time would be like trying to go back and solve a crime years later. People's memories are different. People get mixed up. People have yeah. like accounts for that one. I think the reason that they don't, because it's a case where too much time has passed for you to go back and really do a thorough investigation into, into what actually happened. For one, the sets don't exist anymore. People are going to have contradicting opinions and not enough people are going to come out to speak to that movie because I think too many people on the set were traumatized by what happened. It's something that I don't think we're ever going to be able to have a definitive answer to or whose fault it was exactly or who to pin the blame on. I feel like they should have done a more thorough investigation at the time the film was made. They should have been investigated. The fact that they didn't investigate further and they just kind of let it be it's a malfunction to me is kind of suspicious for one why yeah, that would rubbed me the wrong way why would you not why would you not investigate that but i don't know if that's the fault of the documentarians making this because they're making this years after that should have been investigated a long time ago in reality there should be a thorough re police report by there should have been a thorough release re police report by now that we could have discussed that could have been brought on on the film so all we have left is to go back and talk about the logistics, which I wasn't aware of. So it was good information for me because I didn't follow. I, I mean, I was only three when the crow came out. But even or, if they had, even if they had more of an investigation, if they had less investigation and more of the emotional impact of it, and and more of of uh, illustrating the of how tragic it was, and Michael Berryman was the highlight of the whole thing because he's the only one that I felt any true emotion from about this tragedy mm -hmm. they didn't they didn't go into what a tragedy it was that brandon lee was about to get uh married to his fiance about how they were in close contact but i think if for somebody who doesn't who only has a passing familiarity of what happened on set it could be something it could be very informative that one just depends on your level of involvement with with the two how much it, how much it means to you i mean yeah. i got the sense that it was tragic because i mean i when we found out that his that um, he was going to be married soon after the film is a pretty sad fact. It has such a dedicated cult following that a lot of people follow it, have followed it really closely and know, know a lot of the details. Someone like myself doesn't really have that sort of information. So it was kind of, inf it was kind of informative to me personally. If I had to say which one was the weakest one, I guess it might be that one. And it's because it's the production that the people involved seem to be the least willing to talk about. But I do think it's a good thing that um, that they finished the film, for one thing, because Brandon Lee was so proud of it. And they even made a point that his fiance and his, uh, I believe it was his sister or his mother, asked them to make sure that they complete the film because it meant so much to Brandon Lee. And let's yeah. be honest, he died making that film and no film is worth somebody's life. Nobody's nobody's life is worth a movie. But the fact of the matter is, it it did happen. It would have been a complete have been a complete waste if they didn't release it or if they just let it fall by the wayside. It would have been like Brandon Lee died for nothing. So yeah, it's a good thing that they went through and that they actually finished the film. Even though I, I didn't like that particular episode, I do like that they explored it. Even though, you know, they didn't explore it like I wanted them to, but still they explored it for the people who don't know about it mm -hmm. and, and want to know a little more, a little bit more about it. Probably the most fascinating one and the most infuriating one for me was Twilight Zone, the movie. On this one, they talked to I was, James. I was <clears throat> dreading getting to the fifth episode about the Twilight Zone, the movie, because of the circumstances and the details. Where I was like, oh God, we're going to, we're, we're in for something really awful right now. And it's even worse than I could have imagined. And I'm going to have to restrain myself, but some of it actually really pissed me off when I found about how the set was handled and the cavalier attitude that John Landis. And like, I get, I get it. Some filmmakers really believe in their art. And again, a movie like Apocalypse Now is another example of recklessness, but ultimately, well, the Francis Ford Coppola might have been extremely reckless with people's lives on Apocalypse Now. Nobody died on it, so I can't yeah. say so much.
even if his behavior was questionable. The fact of the matter is, tragedy struck on the set of Twilight Zone, and there has to be some sign of some kind of culpability, and there has to be some kind of responsibility taken at some point when you destroy the lives of two little kids and um, and an adult man, and do it in front of their parents while convincing them that what they're doing is no more dangerous than taking a ride at Disneyland. Yeah. And on this one, they, they talked to the great Kane Hodder, uh, Lloyd Kaufman from Trauma Films, uh, the pro production designer, Richard Sawyer, that was heartbreaking. Uh, they talked to authors, critics, and Ryan Turek again. I learned on this that Jonathan Landis is a remorseless maniac. And, and it angers me even more because it puts you in such a mindset to be um, disappointed and, and frustrated by it because it shows the accident. And I've seen this covered, I've seen this accident covered many times and they always cut it before it actually, before the blades actually hit the people. And my wife came in and she's familiar with that accident. My wife came in and she said, oh, I don't want to watch this. I don't want to see what happened. I said, no, they'll, they'll cut away. They'll cut away. And we're sitting there watching it and they did not cut away. And they showed that blade hit those three people. Man, it made my heart skip a beat. And then for the rest of it, they talked about how it was, it, they, they just they decapitated Vic Morrow and these two children. There were several warnings and red flags that Jonathan Landis completely ignored and forced the situation again and again. And then it really infuriates you because it cuts between the sets of Troma, which is really low budget, cheesy production company. And then between them and the, and talking about the Twilight Zone set and shows the contrast of how much care and respect they have at Troma and how reckless Jonathan Landis was on this movie. And anyone can see that the, that the footage was way too when you watch the footage you you'd see that that situation was way too dangerous the explosions were too large and you could you could tell from looking at it, it was going to make the helicopter crash and they almost did it in a run through once the 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 helicopter pilots had already told them the problems they had with with visuals during the explosions and you see the force of the explosions blowing the water and you see it blowing the clothes and the the hair of the three people. It doesn't take, you can look at that footage, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that what was going on in that set was completely negligible and completely reckless. And I struggle with this because part of this podcast is we have to discuss movies and we have to discuss things honestly. And I don't want to, and towards, when we first started off with this podcast, I was a little bit more opening and bashing some things. I go back and I back and I listen to it and I feel kind of stupid for the way that I bash things or the way that I misunderstood. I wasn't I'm not always right. I've made mistakes on this own podcast before. So I try to tread lightly when discussing filmmakers and what's going on because I don't know everything. But this one is a little bit hard not to if I want to speak honestly. I'm really upset with John Landis and the way that he handed handled that set. For one, they actually had real machine guns on the set firing off and they had there's a scene where Vic Morrow is supposed to be being shot at with machine guns and I understand they pulled him away but they have a bunch of people still firing machine gun bullets off that is so dangerous it's not even funny it's not even fathomable that a director would think that's excusable to do on set to be firing off fucking machine guns when you could have pulled that effect off and make it look just as realistic and just con as convincing without putting anybody's lives in danger. I myself, as some of the director told me that, oh, we're gonna pull out you out of the way from real machine gun uh, bullet fire, be like, you're out of your fucking mind. I am not going, even if you're pulling me out of the way, all it takes is a piece of shrapnel to fall in a different direction. So, and on top of that, those kids were there illegally. Yeah. We we're shooting at times that are illegal for a six and a seven year old to be shooting at 2.30 in the fucking morning. You're not supposed to be shooting like that. So he's already bending the rules. He's being arrogant about it and takes the whole thing fucking lightly. And the fact that he doesn't talk about it that much this day is a bother to me. There has yeah. to be some kind of culpability here. There has to be somebody, you, when people die like that, you can't just pass the buck off and say, oh, well, you know, things happen on a film set. I'm like, no, fuck no, that's not how this works. 
there were you put them in situations that could have been easily avoided and then to tell their parents that what they're doing is no more dangerous than going on a ride at Disneyland what and yeah. the fact that the parents were there and they saw their kids get chopped up by a blade in front of their face is inexcusable it's heartbreaking and then the production designer talking about the fact that they were sneaking real bombs onto the set and saying oh yeah. no it's okay we're gonna push it in a different direction he said you better tell me right fucking now if there are any more traps or any more booby traps on this damn set otherwise i'm shutting it down it's just unfathomable to me that that went on and that it happened the way that it did and like i said i understand the idea of being an artist and pushing you know we got to go for realism we got to do this but you cannot push your artist put your artistic ambitions above the lives of human beings especially when they're human beings who are there trying to help you realize your vision you're taking it's, advantage of them it's it's one thing to have that attitude during during the movie okay he was reckless but maybe he had he, he was uh, singularly focused on on the movie and making it the best he can okay but to still have that attitude after the the accident and still have that attitude years later? Hell no. And the the thing that most bothered me is that when apparently he attended these funerals, and I'm sure that he was sad, but the speech struck me as tone deaf when he said yeah. at Vic Morrow's funeral, it's very sad, but he's preserved on film and film is immortal and film will live forever. I'm like, that's a really empty platitude for people who are dealing with the loss of a loved one it was a tragedy that could have been avoided telling me if i lost a, somebody who i cared very deeply about but tell me because they're in some movies that it's okay no it's not fucking okay i understand yes film is immortal and it's an awesome it's almost a magical medium that we could shoot something and preserve it forever that's awesome don't get me wrong it is but that is not a good excuse for why this man passed away or why those kids were killed i just it doesn't cut it for me and I see. I, I think it's kind of a defense mechanism for Landis. I think that if he really accepted what he did on that set, it would be devastating to him, and he couldn't live with it. That's the only. That's the only thing I can think of. Maybe he's just blocking it out, and that's why he's so cavalier about it. Is he just blocking it out, not letting, not letting himself feel the shame that he should feel for that happening? And. You know, for all I know, he does feel it, and I hope somewhere that he does, but it doesn't really seem to be reflected. Maybe it's inward, and I'm not trying to call judgment, but this story is too extreme, and I can't give my honest opinions about this without being a little bit inflammatory towards John Landis. There's no yeah. way around it. If I were to come on this podcast and try to neuter my opinion and tell you, oh, it wasn't that big, it was okay, I'd be lying to myself, and I'd be lying to our audience. Yeah, and it it's a great decision to end this docu series with this one, because uh, it brings up a really fascinating thing right at the end. How yeah, these these films may or may not be cursed, but this one is the the people who are on the set are cursed because they have to live with what happened on that set. Everyone else seems tortured and still devastated by it, and they still seem to feel like it happened yesterday. It's a fascinating documentary series, and I would recommend it to anybody who's interested in history at all, or any kind of history, because it's fascinating. A movie like The Exorcist, to me, is a historical document. The way that people reacted to it at the time speaks volumes about the era that it was released in. The way that it was marketed as a dangerous film tells you everything you know, have to know about societal attitudes in 1973 and the impact that it had on pop culture. So I think if you're just into like modern history, this is gonna yeah. be a fascinating documentary. You don't need to be into horror movies or even be a particularly big film fan to get a lot out of, out of this documentary series. The next one I'm gonna talk about before we get to the movies is uh, The True Terror with Robert England. It's on the Travel Channel. Now this one is kind of a docu-series as well, but it's a lot less production value than uh, that cursed films. It's a we reported on it on the podcast a while back. It's Robert England introduces the stories and he does some narration uh, of true stories throughout history. And most of them so far that I've seen have been 1800s, early 1900s. But it's all these real stories that are down in history that are really strange. So they kind of uh, Robert England starts out with the narration at the beginning to set up the story. 
I thought it was going to be complete. The stories were going to be completely narrated by him, but that's not the case. Now his his uh, narration is perfect, Robert England. I mean, that's what you watch that show for. He definitely delivers with the narration. With the he's campy and in, in a way only Robert England can be. But as it gets into re the reenactment, the reenactments are very, very cheaply produced, and then other experts and newspaper accounts and commentary from historians start coming in so they start kind of telling the story and then uh robert england backs uh caps it off so to give you an idea i'll go i'll go through the first uh two episodes this is what i've seen so far now i watched episode one now if you watch episode one and you're not into it give it another chance because it picks up a little bit in episode two i don't know why they picked these stories for episode one because this is obviously you, you've got Robert England, which is an excellent narrator and you have some good stories, but it really hinges on whether the, you know, it really depends on the story, whether you're going to enjoy this series or not. Cause the first one is about a North Carolina storekeeper that is tormented by a countdown to his death where he has a nightmare where his dead friends, uh, some dead friends tell him he's going to die in 60 days. And then another one is a teenager has smallpox and he's mistake, mistakenly pronounced dead and buried. And then the third story was a police station in Atlanta battles with a vengeful spirit where a murderer runs into the station saying he's being stalked by ghosts and people and of the people he killed. So it's decent stories, not very riveting, not very uh, profound, not that interesting. And then they were told in a cheap way. So that first episode, Robert England is really the only redeeming quality about it. I mean, there was a couple decent scenes and the stories were okay, but it just wasn't, there's, there's so much better documentaries out there and stuff like this. But episode two got a little better. Um, it started with two ranch hands battle an alligator looking dragon, which is cheap sci-fi channel CGI, but still kind of scary and kind of well told. And the, the actors weren't that bad. And then the second one was about a young Theodore Roosevelt that's told a story about a half-human Bigfoot type creature. That one was well told. The action was a little campy, but it's still well told and it was a fascinating story. And then the time, uh, final one was demons attack a town in rural Pennsylvania and a hunting party goes after them. But that one's the weakest out of those three and it kind of fizzles out at the end. So it just, just from the first two episodes, it seems like this series is going to be a hit or miss but uh, I'm still hanging in there. One of the other films that I watched recently, I actually watched it almost a month ago, I'm just barely talking about it on the podcast right now, is Don't Torture a Duckling, the great giallo film from Lucio Fulci. And as I mentioned a few weeks back, uh, periodically throughout this quarantine, I'll take the time to talk about the different Fulci films I've been binging. And I wanted to discuss this one next. This is a synopsis. A reporter and a promiscuous young woman try to solve a series of child killings in a remote southern Italian town rife with superstition and a distrust of outsiders. I was um, really surprised by this one because it's not what I thought it was going to be. It is a giallo film, don't get me wrong, but I feel like calling it a giallo um, undercuts a lot of what the movie is. I think there's a lot of social satire in this film and a lot of interesting social commentary weaved throughout. It revolves around a small rural town in Italy and the murders that are happening there. And the way that the town reacts to these murders speaks a lot for how they, the way they think and the, the level of closed-mindedness. Right off the bat, the first people that they suspect of being responsible for these killings are a young woman who's from the city, so she dresses a little bit different than people from the town, so she automatically gets judged. A woman who claims to be a witch and other strange characters. While holding certain forms of authority, putting certain forms of authority on a pedestal so much that you fail to see what's in front of you in a way that obstructs getting true justice. The way that the, that the townsfolk react to anybody that's different uh, speaks volumes for the way that the village actually operates. And it reminded me of um, Summer of Sam, the Spike Lee oh. film from 1999, because both of them illustrate how a certain level of paranoia mixed in with ignorance and superstitions could lead you to persecute people that don't deserve to be persecuted. 
And I'm thinking of the witch who we find out is, and I don't think this is too much of a spoiler, she believes that she's responsible for the de- for uh, for these deaths, but she's responsible in a way that doesn't really mean that she's actually responsible. She just believes that her curse actually worked. And we find out later in the movie that these deaths have nothing to do with the curse. It has to do with a very sick individual. And the fact that she's uh, stoned to death by a group of people think that they're doing the right thing shows how you cannot jump to conclusions and judge people based on the fact that they're a little bit different for you or they're not conforming to conforming to what you believe that people should behave like the way that these people hold the church on a pedestal and the way that they can't even bother to look into the fact that maybe not everybody who you think is respectable is on the up and up is really powerful stuff and is really effective i thought it builds to a very good climax that's a, a little hard to predict, uh, really surprised me. I thought it's it's a beautifully filmed film, for one, the way that it makes the Italian countryside, look, the rural countryside, look so beautiful and so appealing, but it reveals the ugliness underneath, the ugliness that comes with judgmental attitudes and people who can't see outside of their bubble. So yeah. I was surprised. I feel like this is a giallo film, yes, a murder and mystery, yes, but I felt like there was so much more to this film than a lot that I feel like goes over a lot of people's heads when they're uh, discussing Don't Torture a Duckling. And before this, the other Fulci films that I had watched were like City of the Living Dead and The Beyond. And those are fantastic movies, but they're very stylist, I, stylistic. I didn't, this level of um, commentary and emotion and the way that the characters relate to each other and the way that they play off caught me really off guard and it ended up being a much richer film than I think it gets credit for being so I was really pleasantly surprised by this movie I liked it a lot I thought the cast was really good I thought all the performances were very believable the murder mystery was good the gore was good it's not as extreme as in some of Lucio Fulci's later films but there is some inventive stuff particularly the stoning of the witch is extremely brutal and was really heartless and what makes that scene interesting it's one of the most brutal scenes in the movie and the horror is coming not from the killer not from the person who's responsible for the murders it's coming from regular people who are too judgmental and can't see how uh, their superstitions is are clouding their judgment it showed the horror that we're all inherently capable of as human beings Overall, I thought it was fantastic. Another notch on Lucio Fulci's belt. Really impressed with this one. I like how Fulci can take uh, gore and exploitation and add so many layers to it. and It's just so fascinating. I don't even think it feels like an exploitation film. I know it can be classified as such, but the movie has a lot more on its mind than just exploitation. Yeah, it has the, the violence and the gore that you would expect from Fulci, the titillating elements, the murder mystery that you'd expect out of a giallo, but there's so much more to it than that. Because of that, I thought this was one of the most satisfying giallo mysteries that I'd ever seen. And the answer to the mystery makes you go back and it makes the audience have to, once they find out who the actual killer is, they have to go back on the film and analyze the preconceived notions that they might have formed while watching the movie. Yeah. And I thought it was just a really great balancing act for uh, Fulci to put this much level of thought and commentary into what could have easily have been just another high quality giallo exploitation thriller. Fulci is always going to take you on a ride that, and that's with multiple layers, but it's going to be titillating along the way no matter what. <laughs> the one that I'm going to talk about is so far removed from Fulci it's crazy but it's still I think it's still going for the same thing that Fulci does but it just fell flat in every way Intruder from 1989 the co-writer and director is Scott Spiegel and if anybody's uh, familiar with the Evil Dead universe he worked with uh, Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell on all their early shorts and he was also Scotty and Within the Woods the short that was uh, that inspired Evil Dead and he was a fake champ in both Evil Dead 1 and 2. He wrote Evil Dead 2 with Sam Raimi, and he produced the Hostel movies. As a director, he just did stuff like Hostel 3, uh, From Dust Till Dawn 2. But uh, uh, this was uh, the executive producer on this one was Charles Brand, and the writer, Lawrence Bender. This is his only writing credit, which I see why after watching the movie. Really quick, for those people who don't know, 
Lawrence Bender produced Tarantino's early films like Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. Yeah. And was the yuppie in Pulp Fiction when Tim Roth is robbing the diner. He says, you fucking yuppie, get down! It's a guy with <laughs> long hair. That's Lawrence Bender. He pretty much did all Tarantino's movies up to Inglorious Bastards, right? That was the last yeah. one he did. I don't think he's been producing his films uh, as of lately. So this is the only film he wrote, and I see why he didn't write another one. <laughs> I don't want to talk shit, but... He had a pretty decent cast. Elizabeth Cox from Night of the Creeps and The, Ra the Wraith. Uh, Renee Estevez, the daughter of Martin Sheen, she was really good in it. Uh, Dan Hicks from Evil Dead 2, the old man, the, the husband from Evil Dead 2. Sam Raimi, Ted Raimi, and Bruce Campbell were in it. All of them had small parts. Sam, Sam and Ted had both had uh, bigger parts than Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell was just tacked on at the end. But it's about an overnight crew in a small supermarket are stalked by a mysterious maniac. At a $130,000 budget, and you can see every bit of it. You can see that it's $130,000. But what I couldn't believe, the makeup is done by Howard Berger, Robert Kurtzman, and Greg Nicotero from KNB. This was after they did Evil Dead 2, Creepshow 2, Phantasm 2, and Monkey Shines. And you could not tell. Straight up shitty effects on this one, too. Not even like, it wasn't even like low budget effects done in an inventive way. They weren't inventive at all. So I looked into it and it's because this one was early in their career and they did do, you know, Evil Dead 2 and Creepshow 2, Phantasm 2 and Monkey Shines. Those were $3 million budgets or over. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the Mo Monkey Shines, the George Romero film was a $7 million budget. So I can kind of see why their effects look out of character for them. There's something that kind of helped it, but ended up hindering it by the end. There was a lot of creative shots. You can tell that this Scott Spiegel was ambitious and he wanted to make a good movie, but he just overshot it. You know, like uh, they did a shot from inside a shopping cart. And then a couple minutes later, there's a shot from inside the grocery scanner. And then there's another shot where the camera is somehow mounted on the doorknob and it turns with the doorknob and then a shot through a, a, an, an entire kill filmed through a wine bottle. <laughs> so it sounds like over the stop, over the top stylistic flourishes. Yeah. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen this movie, but could it be because of the involvement of Sam Raimi and Ted Raimi and Bruce Campbell? Because what a lot of people note about the Evil Dead films is the wildly inventive cinematography, the way that the camera takes on the view of a demon and chases through the woods and it has that kind yeah. of rickety feel. The the Evil Dead films are bursting with this creative, endlessly inventive camera work. And I'd imagine having these people on set would make you feel like you need to live up to that if you're gonna... Yeah. And, and yeah, you see shades of that, but it just, com it just comes off, ultimately comes off as amateur. It reminds me of a, a Fuji film as far as its attempt, it attempted being kind of a Fulci film because it, it starts to tell a decent story about this uh, this girl having an abusive boyfriend and he comes and tries to pull her away from the grocery store and, uh, and then her employees come to help her. And then all of a sudden it becomes a small business drama where they're gonna sell the store and the employees are gonna be out of a job. What are we gonna do now? And that kind of, that kind of uh, it's weaved throughout the rest of the story but it gets really dumb the more it goes along. It's a slasher, it was made in 89, but it plays out more like a 70s slasher, but a bad 70s slasher, where it tries to tell a story, it tries to have layers, but it just comes off as campy. It takes itself way too seriously, and then it doesn't. You know what I mean? Like, we're telling a serious story. Oh no, we're just gonna take these liberties and just have these ridiculous things happen. They didn't commit enough to the drama or the story, and they didn't commit enough to the can't be craziness of it. It's challenging for me to talk about movies like this because I'm talking about how bad it is, but there's a lot of bad movies that we watch that we really like. But it's, so it's hard to explain why this one is so bad that it's bad instead of being so bad that it's good. The final one we're gonna discuss, this is something we've never done before. It's kind of unprecedented that we do this. We're gonna review a movie that we already reviewed earlier uh, last year. It's Pet Cemetery 2019, directed by Kevin Kolsch and, and Dennis Widmeyer. James and I both went on and on about how we did not like this movie. It did not connect with us. 
It didn't touch the original. It didn't touch the Stephen King story. It was just a bad adaptation. I, but our, quick, I saw almost around, I logged all the movies I've seen, almost like 100 movies in 2019, and I rank every movie I've seen in order from the best one I've seen to the least. That one was pretty low down on the list. It was, for <laughs> me, one of the worst movies I'd seen that year. So yeah. for us it, to have the kind of switch around we're going to have right now is pretty fascinating. Yeah, it not only didn't live up to the story, I just thought, I just think it was an openly bad movie. There's this mutual friend of ours on Facebook. His name is Will Walker. He's a fellow filmmaker and he's a critic also. He told me, he kept insisting that, to me that there was a good movie in here, in this Pet Cemetery 2019. And I said, no, there's too many flaws with it. He said, yeah, there's a good movie in there somewhere, trust me. So he put together a fan edit of this movie, which he took the movie itself with some of the uh, deleted scenes and he re-edited it and reordered some of the scenes, took some stuff out and it ended up being about the same length, but it's a wildly different movie. So there was a it's bunch three of- Three minutes shorter. Huh? It's three minutes shorter. Yeah, three minutes shorter, but it's slight tweaks that made the characters more likable and real right away. Mm -hmm. All the characters. And all it took was a little changing of changing of orders of scenes and a few tweaks here and there. Just taking out a little bit, just a few seconds, did so much for it. Okay, the first problem I had with it when it first went off the went off the rails for me, when Lewis Creed is working in the hospital and that guy comes in with half of his face off. And this is the one that dies and then he comes back from the dead to warn Lewis of the Pet Cemetery. This character was saying too much. It was edited and filmed in a way that seemed cheesy and off-putting to me. The character was Victor, Victor Pascal, played, played by Absa Ahmed. And I think the movie that Wales originally edited did a disservice to this actor because actually when you take out some of his character, he actually becomes a better character and more believable. So he took out just enough of this character's lines to make him scarier and feel like more of a part of the movie instead of being forced in there just because it's in the story. That's what it felt like to me in the original. He pushed some scenes together, which made the Judd and the Ellie relationship more touching. He added bonding moments between Judd, Crandall, and uh, Lewis Creed. That was another problem with the, with the original where not the original, the original uh, remake or yeah. retelling. Theatrical <laughs> cut of Pet Cemetery. Yeah, and I thought that that the relationship between Judd and Lewis kind of appeared out of nowhere, and they were all of a sudden friends after you'd only seen him, you'd only seen Judd talk with Ellie, and then all of a sudden he has this bond with the with the uh, Lewis. So what this guy Will Walker did was change the order of some of the scenes. He had. Uh, a bonding moment with uh, Judd, and, Judd and Lewis right between, right after he came over to dinner to strengthen their bond. So that strengthened their bond there and that fixed a lot of that relationship that I thought was flawed. The funeral kids and masks were used to much better effect and scattered throughout the film a little more. So once you see these kids, this funeral procession going, going across their vision and you see uh, the mask they have on, then you see the mask keep appearing throughout and it's and it's handled in a much better way the way he he uh, edited it together. One of the main differences I've seen, the Zelda character. The Zelda character was a cheesy, uh, formulaic kind of monster. It, it didn't feel like a human to me. It didn't feel scary. It didn't feel dev emotionally devastating the way it was supposed to do to the wife. But now all of a sudden it does and all this guy had to do was cut out the parts where Zelda was all, her bones were cracking and she was coming at her like a monster. And she kind of, he kind of left the story in there where she falls down through the dumbwaiter. And it's another scene where less is more. The less you see of Zelda, the more you feel her presence. It was much better in this edited version. And then there was a great montage he edited together of Lewis Creed dealing with the church while Judd was explaining the pet cemetery. And that leads right into it being much clearer that Judge Crandall was manipulated by the cemetery. I felt that much more. Before, in, in the other one, I felt like he was very careless, like he seemed to care about the family at first, and then all of a sudden he sends them to the pet cemetery to be really? ravaged. 
quick. That was one of my biggest problems with the the theatrical version. The character of Judd, the way that he comes across, I found the found it really absurd because it seems like he deliberately went out of his way to mislead this family and yeah. lead them into uh, lead them to something that he knew was dangerous, that he knew would put their lives at risk, and then acting like he cared about it before. I thought the whole concept of that was so fucking stupid in the theatrical cut. It didn't make any sense. And it was a contradiction with the character because the theatrical cut presents him as somebody who cares about the family, yes, but will recklessly endanger them and exactly. enable the situation to happen. In the fan cut that Will Walker does, you get a more sense that, like you said, it was beyond his control. And it kind of amazes me that when they were editing this movie together that they couldn't see how bad that came across, not to yeah. make it more clear that it was manipulation, that it doesn't even make sense in terms of the story for him just to really lead them to danger for no fucking reason whatsoever. And and it wasn't like this uh, guy, Will Walker, had to make some radical changes and completely switch the movie around. He didn't. It's just little tweaks, especially to the Judd Crandall character. Little bitty tweaks made you feel for him so much more, and it, it, and, and it never loses you. Because after watching this and analyzing what, exactly what he did to it, I went back and watched the theatrical cut again, and I could honestly, I could barely sit through it. When I watched this, watched this edited version, I just put it on just for, out of curiosity. I really didn't think that this could be made into a good movie. But as I watched it, there was nothing that took me out of it, nothing that pissed me off, nothing that made me feel like I was watching a bad movie. And when I went to watch it back, I just got, I got so bored with it. I wanted to go to sleep. I just, I couldn't bring myself to sit through it. I almost didn't make it to the end. And it was so, such small changes. What I think this speaks for is how important editors are in the filmmaking process. It's really the invisible art that a lot of people don't notice. I feel like a lot of editors, people think that's not important. People don't get it. Having a good editor and a bad editor can make all the world of difference in your film. Because anytime you shoot a movie, what you have when you shoot a movie is a giant blob of footage. And it's a, like it's like a diamond. You have to polish it, you have to refine it, you have to craft it until you shape it into something cohesive and coherent. So most movies have potential to be good. It's just a matter of shaping it in the right way. And Will Walker's tiny tweaks shaped this into a more cohesive film. It shaped it into a more involving film. It took out the little things that made the movie stupid and replaced it with something a lot more intelligent. And it shows that some of the deleted scenes should have been left in and some of the scenes that were yeah. in the theatrical cut should have never have made it. So it's not even, I was, I have to say I was wrong by putting this on the filmmakers because the filmmakers shot good footage and they had a lot of potential it just wasn't edited in the proper fa uh, in the fashion that was going to maximize all of the footage they shot will walker saw the potential in the footage and found a way to maximize its potential so hats off to you will <laughs> yeah <laughs> you did a, a really impressive job and turned a movie i really hated into a good movie not a perfect one it's still yeah. not like a big fan of it but it made it watchable and at the very least now i could see what the filmmakers were going for in the first place it's still not as good or effective or as scary as mary lambert's pet cemetery in the scenes that they completely screwed up like this one of the main scenes that i really took issue with is the fake out gage is supposed to be killed in the street by a truck ellie is killed instead but they do so much fake out in the editing. They're, Ooh, it's gonna be Gage, it's gonna be Gage. Oh, guess what, it's Ellie. That was so lame. And the way he, the way Will Walker did it right here is so much better. There's no lame fake out. It still doesn't, you still don't feel that this couple's kid was killed. Like in the first, in Mary Lambert's Pet Cemetery, I could feel that, I'm a father. And I was, I'm devastated every time I watch that scene. You feel like that couple's child just got ran over. Mm -hmm. On this one, you don't feel that, but it's still so much better than than what it was in the original theatrical cut. When Ellie comes back from the dead, that was always the best part for me. And uh, so that part got a little more attention in this cut of it. 
it's clear that the mom knows something is wrong and tries to get back to Lewis. You could, you could feel the mom's desperation more. You could feel she was trying to get back to her husband. You could feel that she knew that something was wrong and it was much, uh, much more clear. The fight with Ellie was more effective. It felt more disturbing. It felt like... Uh, they were like the almost invisible tweaks. Yeah. You can't put your finger on it, but you could tell something was lopped off somewhere. The, something was slightly reordered or something, yeah. something was moved and, around. And it shows me that when you're watching a movie and you're going along and something just kind of off and kind of pisses you off, it kind of taints the scenes after it. Mm -hmm. So with that scene gone, you don't look as harshly at the following scene. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can feel it a little bit more because you weren't just distracted by bullshit. The ending was the best part for me. I mean, it, it did rub a lot of people the wrong way. It was the only thing that it was uh, ventured wildly away from the original story. But I thought it was, it showed imagination, but it still left you with a weird feeling. The ending was much better on this edit. Will made it better and less hokey because even though I liked the ending of the other one, it still felt a little hokey at the end compared to the rest of it because the rest of it really tried to take itself overly serious. And then it had a, it had a similar ending, but it wasn't as ham handed. And he did something bold with, he completely cut out Judd Crandall's death. Mm -hmm. And it worked because that was another fake out that pissed me off. Oh, it's, it was, it's like the filmmakers are saying, oh, remember when Judd Crandall's ankle got cut in the, the first adaptation? We're going to do that again. Oh, look. Oh, psych. We're going to do it in another area. I think the problem with, with that scene in there, the theatrical cut, is that it, it almost counts on the viewer to be familiar with the pet sem the original pet cemetery. Exactly. And granted, a lot of people who watch it are going to be familiar with the original pet cemetery, but that's a mistake because a film's quality shouldn't have to derive from a completely unrelated film that you've seen in your past. It shouldn't work like that. And it's going to be even less effective for somebody who's not familiar with the original Pet Cemetery. Some people just wanted to check out this new one. What's the point of the fake out? It doesn't really do anything yeah. for the audience. It took the major problems I had with it and completely got rid of them. And then there's little problems along the way that just keeps it a solid, entertaining movie from beginning to end. I'm, I'm very impressed with what Will Walker did on this. Yes. So was I. Surprised <laughs> you turned a movie that I hated into something manageable and watchable and even kind of good. We're filmmakers and editors and we couldn't see a good movie in there, but this guy did. <laughs> you remember when we were, when we first started editing, I thought, man, we're going to have to do reshoots on this. We're going to have to rethink some of this. I don't know what we're going to do to make this a good movie, but we sat there and chiseled away at it and chiseled away at it until it got to to be an excellent movie that I'm very proud of. Yes, and I think Talk, talking about uh, Mike's feature film debut, Pay Up, uh, we spent so much time editing it and we thought that it, it turns out that you don't really need to reshoots after all if you know how to edit things right or when to play certain footage or know when a scene is going on too long or know when one piece of dialogue is one or two lines too much. When character doesn't need to say all of this, all you need to do is hear him saying this that's when you realize, yeah. then you start shaping your film. It's almost like a diamond. It's not impressive until you sand off the edges, polish it just right, and you get something cohesive. It's easier for you to feel like you're cutting corners, mm -hmm. but you're really not. If you put creativity and passion into it and you, you put the time into it to hammer it out, you can, make, you can make something great without doing a bunch of unnecessary reshoots. Editing. In a, in a kind of way is actually the final draft of a script. It's like taking a script and refining the script after the script is already done, is already shot. Yeah, and what they, the, this is what they say all the time in editing, don't be afraid to kill your babies. Yes. Which means all these scenes and, and, you know, these scenes and these lines that you really are in love with and you want in there, think about the good of the movie instead of that single line. Because take it out, you can make the movie better no matter how much you love that line or that scene. Because there's a lot of good, and a lot of filmmakers kind of fall in love with their work, which is understandable. But there's a lot of scenes in films that 
maybe as a scene onto itself, it's cool and it's impressive, but when it jibes, sometimes it gets in the way with the narrative. Sometimes it slows things down or sometimes it makes things more choppy. When you're in there editing your own, your own films, my only advice to people is if you really think it doesn't work and you still think the scene is cool, take it out. I don't care how cool it is. You could always, you could always put it back in later if you think it, if it needed after all. You could always, what deleted scenes are for so you could see what, what happened. But most of the time, you're never going to end up using all of the footage you shot. It's not feasible. Exactly. And, and you're going to have to lose some things you like in order to serve the whole. It's yep. something to accept. Yes. And it's it's something that Will Walker obviously gets because he nailed it on this movie that we didn't think there was a good movie in there, but he pulled it out. So good for you, Will Walker. Till next week. Happy, happy horror. horror.